Good morning, everybody. This is Rolando Mia, and welcome to Dr. Tom's Tips on using the ice slide on Tuesday. So today, what we're going to talk about is using the ice slide with gagging patients. With the increase in the number of new people utilizing the ice slide, especially for infection control, one of the questions that were being asked, Dr. Hirsch, is this issue of gagging patients. For patients that you believe or are gag sensitive, what advice, what tips and tricks would you want to give uh, the users out there? Good morning, Rolando. So I've been doing this for 20 years with the Isolite. I've got a lot of experience. In the very beginning of the Isolite career, when we were giving these Isolites out to key influencers, every single one of them was gagging themselves as they were putting it in the mouth. And the reason why was they didn't know how to insert it. So learning how to insert the mouthpiece is paramount and that's number one. We'll get back to that in a moment. What we're going to deal with right now is specifically the gag sensitive patient. So the first thing that we have to determine is, is this a psychological gagger or is it a physiological gagger? How do we do that? If you start coming to the patient or towards the patient, they start going like that. You've got a psychologically gag sensitive patient, which brings me back to a dental convention that I was doing some years back. I had a dentist who was actually sitting in the chair who was an extreme gagger. So he wanted to try it in his mouth just to see how it worked. And I said, okay, that's just fine. I picked up an ice light mouthpiece and I started coming to his mouth like this. And he was having a gag sensitive reaction before I ever got it to his mouth. I stopped for a second, I regained composure and I said, just relax, let's take a breath. This is gonna go into an area that's not gag sensitive. Let's go ahead and try it again. So we tried it again as the mouthpiece is going into his mouth like this and getting forward. From about this point, he's actually having an induced gag reflex. This is a psychologically gag sensitive patient. So what do we do here? IV sedation or IM sedation, IV sedation, oral sedation, and anesthesiologist. That's the only way you're gonna be able to work on this particular type of patient. But if they're actually physiologically gag sensitive, then we have to determine where that gag sensitive area is coming from. So usually it's on the soft palate and I'm going to share with you my technique for dealing with a gag sensitive patient. Number one, when I'm sizing the mouthpiece, I always pick a size smaller than what I think they're going to need. If they're a medium mouthpiece, I'll go with the small. If they're a large mouthpiece, I'll go with a medium. If they're a small size mouthpiece, I'll go with a pediatric or an extra small mouthpiece. So we have these options available for you so you can actually get into the right size mouthpiece. For instance, I'm a medium mouthpiece. So instead of, and how do I determine the size? Uh, all of our new customers uh, need a size determination. The way that we used to do it, the way that I still do it personally, is how far their internecidal opening is. If they can open two fingers or about 25 millimeters of internecidal opening, that's a small. Three fingers or 35 millimeters of internecidal opening is a medium. Four fingers of internecidal opening is a large. So that's how we determine it. So I just say that I was a medium. I'm going to go with a small mouthpiece. That's number one. Number two. Before we put the mouthpiece in, we need to moisten the backside of the mouthpiece with our three-way syringe, and we need to Vaseline the patient's lips. I like Vaseline, it's smooth, it's slippery, it stays on for a while, the patient's lips don't get dry, so Vaseline their lips, that's number two. And then of course we said go with a smaller size mouthpiece. So, smaller size mouthpiece, since I can really open wide, I'm gonna use a medium. The important thing to do when you're inserting the mouthpiece is not to go right down the center of the uh, mouth. Don't go, don't fold the mouthpiece up like this and then put it right down the center of the mouth. That will then get to a gag sensitive area. What I do is fold the mouthpiece up like this and I will insert this into the cheek. I'm gonna back up because I forgot to tell you something. 
So what I do to find out if they're gag sensitive in the mouth is I'll actually take my index finger and go into the go into the buccal vestibule. If they're not gagging over there, I know I'm going to be pretty good. And the next thing, I'll just kind of go around the oral cavity like that. If they're not gag sensitive there. I know I'm probably going to have a pretty good shot at this. So fold the mouthpiece up, put it into the buccal vestibule, the folded part right here. We're going to go into the buccal vestibule. And then after we get into the buccal vestibule, we're going to pull it across and engage the bite block on the other side. So in. That's how I insert it. So okay. if I have a quick question, Dr. Hirsch, what percent of the patients that you'll run into in your experience, your 20 years, would do you believe would be truly gag sensitive and they wouldn't be able to tolerate the system? Fabulous question, Rolando. So what I have found over 20 years of experience is I have about 5% of my patients that are actually gag sensitive. On the convention floor in dentistry and in my office, with these 5% of patients that are gag sensitive, I'm about 70% 70 70 successful of the gag sensitive patients. The other 30%, nah, I lose. I lose that one. So you can figure of those 5%, you're going to be 70% 70, 70 successful. So we've got a real high success rate here. Awesome. Awesome. And then a, a second question, and I, I like the context. When or if you you identify a patient is gag sensitive, you go one size smaller. Now, a question: If you look at it, when you use a smaller mouthpiece, does that in any way decrease the ice like's ability to evacuate kind of the the fluids, but also the aerosols and uh, you know and and all of the the things that are coming out of the patient's mouth? Does it compromise that in any way? Great technological question. Uh, it's got a yes or no answer to that. So number one. Does it vacuum as well the oral fluids and the handpiece debris as well in the buccal vestibule, lingual vestibule? No, not as well. But what it does do is it does create a negative vacuum inside the entire oral cavity. So even though we don't have as good of an isolation in the mouth, we're still pulling back in all the debris. So we're trapping most of the debris, most of the debris in the mouth so it's not coming out into the atmosphere and it's not becoming airborne. Um, a certain amount is gonna come out to be airborne, but it's not gonna be that high volume that you would expect um, that you might have. So it continues to evacuate and continues to capture the debris and the aerosols, and it still protects the mouth, even though you use a smaller mouth. Exactly. So <laughs> even though you're using a smaller size on these gag sensitive patients, once again, I don't want this to become routine that, oh, I'm gonna use a small for everybody because if you're using a small for everybody, then you're not protecting the throat, the airway as much, something can drop past there. So on these gag sensitive patients where you have an issue, where you have to go ahead and work on these patients, smaller is going to work for them. If you can get a larger mouthpiece in there, great. If you put a small mouthpiece in there, then what you might have to do is you might have to accentuate that and add a cotton roll here or roll up a, uh, a gauze square and put that into the into the area where it's not sealed off. Awesome, awesome. So physiological versus psychological. Uh, those are two things you need to determine. Percentage of gag is about 5%, if I, I've caught that correctly. Yes. For those that you identify after you size them correctly, one size smaller. Um, testing, I love the testing where what is, you're inserting your finger into the buccal vestibule, and if they, if I understand, if they can tolerate that, then there's a high probability they can also tolerate yeah. it. Yeah. Wet, lubricate the mouthpiece so it slides in really nicely, and then um, from a, from an insertion perspective, always start with the buccal vestibule, and then you can come across anything else that you'd like to give or any other tips and tricks with regard to that. You know, I think I think that's about it on this one. I mean, I've got other tips and tricks, but that's going to be for another thing. Uh, yeah, we'll just stop it for the gag sense of the patient right here. So that will be another Tom, Tom's uh, Tom's tips on Tuesday. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Hurst. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Hope this is helpful. Those of you who are watching uh, or if you have any questions or have any additional feedback or tips you'd like to hear from Dr. Hirsch, please let us know. We look forward to it. Thank you, Dr. Hirsch. Please stay safe, appreciate it, and we'll see you again. Have a wonderful rest of your week.
Rolando, thank you so much. I really appreciate that, everybody. We're looking forward to possibly getting back to work on the 15th of May. Yay, let's keep our fingers crossed. We want to do that so bad. Make sure you have your staff trained. Don't wait until they all come back in. Take advantage. Bring your staff in early. Get them going on training. So awesome. we look forward to seeing you next Tuesday. All right. Take care. Thank you, sir. Bye, everybody. Thanks for watching.